All right, well, great. Well, thanks for having me. I'm uh, happy to be able to kick off the uh, second part of the, the big day on big data. I came here mostly because of that name. Nobody else has had the nerve to put the word big in a title twice, but uh, so I'm excited about that. So what I want to do is uh, give you an overview of a, uh, a project we've d been doing at Berkeley for the past few years. Uh, it's in the context of a group called the AMP Lab. I want to tell you a little bit about the AMP Lab. And then the uh, particular thing I'm going to talk about is a set of, uh, it's a software platform we've been building as an open source uh, platform uh, called the Berkeley Data Analytics Stack. So uh, just to set some context, if uh, you've been paying any attention at all, you're probably uh, a little confused about what's going on in the, in the world of big data. There's just, you know, every day a new system announced, a new company announced, a new company with a new system. Um, and so uh, you're not the only one who's had that problem. There's been uh, uh, some attempts to make sense of this space. So this is one I, I kind of like. Uh, this is from a, an outfit called 451 Research. It's actually over a year old, so things have gotten much more complicated than this. Uh, but, you know, they try to map out the different areas of big data. If you can't read this, each, each uh, one of those uh, little dots on the metro map is a different system or a different company. And the actual point of this wasn't to make it clearer. It was actually to, to show how confusing things really were. So I think it succeeded there. Uh, but what I liked when I uh, was sitting in, you know, in my, in my uh, academic office at, at Berkeley uh, and looking at this, I noticed up in the uh, upper right-hand corner, they had our, our little research project. So uh, I felt, uh, okay, great. That must mean we've arrived. You know, we're part of what's going on. And you know, there's a lot going on. So I'm going to tell you about our little corner of, uh, of the world here. Um, all right, so since I uh, got to go first, I get to be the one that talks about what big data is, and then everyone else has to just say, yeah, whatever Mike said, that's what it is. So, um, so let me give you a couple minutes on, on setting up the big data problem or, or opportunity. All right, so why is, why is all this excitement about big data? The, in, a short, in, for, you know, in short, it's because it's so pervasive, really. Uh, any domain you can think about uh, is uh, collecting more and more data is becoming data driven. And so I'm going to pick out four areas that have been driving our work. The first one is the one that I think a lot of people uh, here probably are thinking about, at least from the companies, is you know, the massive amount of data that's just being uh, created by online activity. So as uh, you most likely know, every time you do something simple on the internet, say, you know, click on a link, this fires off a whole cascade of operations, uh, not only with the uh, entity that you're dealing with and the company that you're dealing with, but with their partners, with their partners' partners, with you know, cascades of uh, you know, computing and communications equipment spread all over the place. And so one little click you know, kicks off this, this flurry of, of events. Uh, those uh, events all generate um, log records. Those log records all get uh, you know, produced and collected somewhere. Okay, so, you know, click streams, uh, you know, uh, anything about advertising, anything about people watching media online and so on. So, huge source of data when you hear, uh, uh, you know, about companies dealing with tens of terabytes of data a day, this is the kind of stuff that often you're, you're hearing about, okay? Second one is user-generated content, and here, you know, there's sort of a couple classes is media, which is, uh, you know, videos and images and things like that, which are, are large in, uh, in terms of number of bytes. Um, you know, there's some work you have to do to extract content out of those. Um, and then things that are smaller but are actually quite content rich for the, for the amount of space they take up, uh, like blogs, like tweets, you know, other text-based things that people do online. So um, very different type of data, but also uh, growing in size and, and um, and importance. So the second one is user-generated content. Now, both of these types of big data are driven by the activities of people. And so somehow the amount of data that is being created is proportional to the, the, the activity of people online. Okay? But as you look forward, um, there are other sources of big data that, don't, that aren't subject to that constraint. And so uh, we heard some talks yesterday on the Internet of Things or machine-to-machine -machine communication. So as you start deploying smart, smart infrastructure, um, you, you know, and devices and 
you know, everything you interact with in the physical world is connected to the internet. All those devices are constantly collecting data, constantly transmitting data and telemetry. Okay, and so uh, the Internet of Things is sort of a growing area where uh, data is being created and is not subject uh, to being driven by the activities of people. So it could actually end up growing much faster. And then finally, um, if you look at scientific computing, uh, this is an area that drives a lot of our work at the university. Um, you know, in a nutshell, the way that science is being done across all domains is completely changing. And it's going from, uh, uh, you know, the, the process of, you know, coming up with theories and then running experiments to prove or disprove those theories or creating simulations and so on um, to actually just collecting lots of data and then doing data-driven science. So letting the data drive uh, the hypotheses in some way. And what's happening there is fascinating. So this is a slightly old picture now, but what it's showing is on a log scale over time, this is Moore's law. So this uh, straight line, which isn't super interesting, um, that's the law that drives a lot of our innovation, right? That, that uh, computers are getting faster and cheaper uh, at this exponential rate, okay? But this other line, this one that's dropping off much, much, much faster, that's the cost of sequencing genomes. Uh, and the rate of, uh, of development, particularly in the genomic space, has just been phenomenal. And in a sense, if you're a genomics researcher, that gap is how much slower your computers are getting every year. Okay, so we're used to living in a world where, you know, we get more and more computational power and we get to figure out what to do with it. These people are in the opposite case. They're getting so much data that their computers are becoming the bottleneck and, you know, the gap just continues to grow. Okay, so for all these reasons, you know, there's excitement about big data, pretty much, you know, across all those domains. All right, so when people describe what's big data, you'll hear the three V's. So again, I'll be the one that sort of uh, just mentions them. Uh, so the traditional three V's are, are volume, uh, in that you have a lot of data, velocity, in that the data is coming at you faster and faster, and variety, in that it's coming from lots of places. And the combination of those, plus some people like to invent other V's, is, uh, you know, what's causing the need for new solutions and new technology. And it's actually a really great way, I think, to describe big data. But when we started our project, our view was quite different, um, although I think you'll see that it's related. So the way we looked at big data was that you're, you're using data to answer a question or to try to make a decision. And you have this envelope that you need to do your work within, right? So if you're trying to make a decision, you have a certain time within which making that decision has to happen. You have a certain amount of uh, money that you can spend on collecting data and on processing data and on analyzing data. So you have a budget. Uh, and then you need a certain confidence in your answer and a certain uh, confidence in the, in the data that you've gotten uh, in order to be able to make your decision uh, you know, with, with confidence. So um, in a sense, the big data problem boils down to this that as the data you're looking at continues to grow, it becomes more and more difficult to be able to answer your question and stay within this, this sort of three-dimensional envelope you have uh, in order to, to, to be able to effectively use the data. And so what, the way you attack that is say, okay, the data's growing, that's great, we're, you know, we're engineers. What we'll do is we'll build systems that are more efficient and we'll figure out how to run faster. We'll be able to analyze more data within the same amount of time or within the same amount of cost or, you know, with the same quality. And then that'll solve the problem. And in a, in a sense, that's what a lot of people are working on is how do we process data faster? How do we come up with more clever algorithms, with more clever architectures and so on? So that works for a while, but eventually as the data continues to grow, um, that's not going to get you all the way. At that point, you have to start making trade-offs and you have to start looking at things like um, if I want my answer within a certain amount of time, how much is that going to cost me? Can I pay more and get the answer faster? Or am I willing to accept an answer of lower confidence? Is that going to be sufficient for what I'm trying to do? And so I believe that big data research is going to move from kind of where most things are today in terms of just how do we make things go faster uh, into the second regime of how do we make intelligent trade-offs uh, that are going to allow us to stay within this three-dimensional uh, space that we have for decision making. All right, so um, you'll hear a lot, I assume, about volume, uh, velocity, and variety. 
That's why doing this is hard, right? Those three V's are why doing this is hard. But if, the, if you look at the, the actual problem to a user, to, to one of those people who's trying to solve a problem in one of those domains we just talked about, that's what the problem is. Okay, so that's the way we've been looking at it in the lab. All right, so that's all I want to say about what's big data. Uh, I should have asked for an extra five minutes because that was my job and no one else will have to do it now. You might hear some other opinions. All right, so let me tell you about what we're doing at, at Berkeley. So we built this thing called the AMP Lab, and AMP stands for three things. Algorithms, uh, think about machine learning, statistical methods, and so on. Machines, cluster computing, cloud computing, scale-out architectures, right? Trying to uh, leverage more and more hardware to solve the problem. And as was mentioned in the opening remarks, which I was happy to hear, the P is for people. And you want to look at people um, at least from two dimensions, at least that's what we're doing. One is sort of as individual uh, data analysts and, and, and data scientists or teams of them. And then the other is as a resource for actually helping you collect data and make sense of data. So think about crowdsourcing and, and human computation, okay? And the goal of the AMP Lab is to dev develop an architecture that seamlessly integrates these three different types of resources. And if you think about it, it's a huge challenge, right? Because they're very different. The way that people process information is very different than the way a scalable computer uh, is gonna process that information. Um, but if you're thinking about having to make trade-offs you know, across time, across quality, across uh, resources, you have to do that you know, across all of these resources. Okay, and so that was sort of the grand challenge that we set up. How do you, how do you build that system? So, um, we started the groundwork for this uh, in kind of mid-2009. It took us about a year and a half to get it off uh, the ground. We started it in 2011. Um, the AMP Lab is the latest uh, example of a, of a thing we've been doing at Berkeley, at least in, in the computer science department, um, of setting up uh, collaborations among faculty to solve a problem. Uh, and uh, one of the aspects, there's a few interesting aspects of this model. Uh, one of which is that when you start the project, you say when it's going to end, okay? And there, there's a lot of interesting reasons for that I don't have time to go into. Um, but if you're interested in this model, um, David Patterson, who's one of the guys in our lab, has an article in, in this month's communications of the ACM called uh, how, to, how to Have a Bad Research Center. And he basically, you know, takes the negation of everything we've tried to do and says, yeah, if you do, if you do that, you'll have a bad center. So we've try to negate that and have a good center. But one of the rules is you should have a fixed uh, end date, so we do that. Another rule is that you should get people from a lot of different areas and get them to commit to working together. And part of the reason you have an end date is so that you can say to people, hey, you know, will you work on this five-year project with me? And then, you know, after five years, go back to your, <laughs> you know, your friends in, in, in your area. And so um, that's what we did. We started it off as a five-year project. A year into it, we got a five-year uh, grant as part of the White House's uh, big data initiative. So we said, all right, we'll do it for six years. Um, but we collected about 60 people, faculty, students, and uh, postdocs, and so on. And uh, this is a group of faculty that are involved. And um, we have three co-directors. So myself, I'm a database guy by training. Uh, Mike Jordan, who's a machine learning guy, and Jan Stoika, who's a, a systems uh, researcher. And we said, all right, you know, those are the main technologies that we're going to be doing in, in the group. So, so let's build a, a, you know, a team around those three areas. And that's what we've done. But you can see that, you know, we've got, you know, a bunch of different representatives from different areas. So we have networking, security, HCI, and so on. You know, you can look at that list and say, well, you don't have this or you don't have that. And that's true. And part of the challenge of setting up one of these projects is to draw some boundaries because the problem's so big, you can sort of keep expanding. So this is a team that we had. And um, we're doing a bunch of applications in-house because to do big data research, you need some big data. So I'll tell you about one of our applications. Um, the other thing that we've done is um, from the very beginning, we engaged industry. And so um, we went out and um, got a number of uh, industry sponsors. I think the current number is, is 23. Um, so, um, you know, our funding is pretty interesting. It comes about half from companies and about half from the federal government. And that gives us, um, you know, great flexibility in what we do. And we basically meet with people from the companies twice a year. Uh, we have three-day uh, off-site retreats and uh, very intensive. Uh, all the students present their work. Uh, people from all these companies, 
you know, look at what's going on, they figure out what they're interested in, they meet the students, they meet the other researchers, and uh, it's a very high bandwidth uh, give and take uh, where we get just phenomenal feedback and information uh, from these people who are, you know, really living the problems that, that we're working on. So it's a pretty unique structure and it's allowed us to, to be pretty ambitious about what we do. Okay, let me just uh, give you an example of one of our applications just so that you have an idea of, of you know, just so, to sort of set the stage. So we built a system called Carrot, uh, which runs on a smartphone. And what it does is pretty simple. It, 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 it just watches what applications are being run on the, on, the self, on the smartphone. It watches what's happening to the battery. And just periodically, it just reports uh, that back to the cloud. So we have an application that's running on our stack in the cloud. It's collecting data from all these phones. And what's interesting, and this is the reason I mention it, because this is, this is how big data works. If you collect enough of those samples from enough different devices, you can start to build very interesting, very detailed models of how different applications impact the battery on, on different devices. Okay? Now, what that then lets you do is for a particular individual, you can then look at what's happening on their phone and you can say, hey, you're doing these things that are, are known to cause you know, battery drain on your phone. You know, you're running Skype and Skype on, on your particular device is known to to be a battery hog, and in fact, by looking at other people with your device who aren't using Skype, we can predict that if you, if you stopped using Skype, your battery would last an extra two hours and five minutes a day, okay? And we can do that because we've seen enough samples, okay? Likewise, we can find things that are happening on your phone that aren't normal. Like when you run Google Maps, your battery seems to drain, but most people that run Google Maps that have your phone don't have that problem, so maybe you should reinstall it. So, um, we built this thing, we tested it in the lab with 70 phones, because we had about 70 people. Uh, it worked, so we said, great, we released it, it got uh, blogged about, it went viral. We got about 100,000 downloads our first weekend, and the system died a horrible death. Uh, <laughs> closed it down for a couple weeks, figured out how to make it scale, which we should have done in the first place. Put it back up, and we're slowly, you know, our, our one-star ratings on the App Store are slowly turning into, you know, three-and-a-half-star ratings. So we're getting better. So we've had, uh, you know, we're getting up close to a million downloads now. And this is graduate student developed code, right? So this is, uh, you know, a, a few students in the lab who decided to do this, put it out in the world, and it took off. And that's actually going to be one of my main themes uh, throughout what I tell you about, that, you know, the world's changed as a researcher. Uh, especially an academic researcher. You know, it used to be that you'd do your work, you'd write your paper, um, and you'd hope that when you gave your talk at the conference, somebody from a company would be in the audience, and if they liked your idea, they'd figure out how to put it into their product, and maybe you'd hear about it, and maybe you wouldn't. But that's gone now. Um, with, you know, the ability to say, just put software out the way we did with Carrot, and just have the world find out about it. Or, as I'm going to tell you about with uh, our software stack, you know, the ability to engage with the open source community um, is just a direct link now. You build something, you put it out, and people get to use it and try it. And if it does anything good, they'll talk about it and, you know, you get the network effect. So uh, it's really an exciting time to be doing this kind of work. All right. So, but this is just an example of uh, a, a, a very typical kind of big data application. Um, it's a little glib to say it, but, it, but it's important. Um, if you think about things like personalized medicine, it's the same kind of pattern, right? You collect lots of information about individuals, you aggregate it, and then use that information to figure out what's normal and what's abnormal, and then you can use those models to uh, then make personalized recommendations uh, back to people, okay? And so that's one of the big uses of, of big data. See, I use big twice in the same sentence. Um, collect enough information about enough things, and then you get insights that you couldn't get if you were just looking at small samples. That's the idea, all right? And this is one example of that. Um, I kind of just made this point, but a big part of what we've been doing, we've been doing our research, we've been writing our papers, we've been graduating our students. But from the very beginning, we decided we wanted to really engage the open source community. And so we've been um, actively doing that. We've been holding meetups, we've been holding boot camps, uh, and it's really uh, had a huge effect. So this is a picture from uh, last summer. One of my students was uh, giving a talk on on his research on scalable machine learning. Uh, and we held it at the Twitter, the, uh, Twitter headquarters, the new headquarters in San Francisco. Uh, they let about 200 people in, and they turned away about 150 people. Um, and this is you know, a student who's up talking about his research on a, on a Thursday afternoon. So um, you know, if you engage with the community, 
you can start to have the very, very quick impact and very, uh, you know, start to, to get lots of uh, uh, insights and, and input from people. So we've been actively doing that. All right, so what I want to do with the remainder of my time is, is tell you a little bit about this artifact that we're building. It's called BDAS, the Berkeley Data Analytics System, or STACK, and um, it's pronounced, the acronym is, is pronounced badass, if you've, if you've heard that, so uh, I will try to say that without cracking a smile. But yeah, so it's called the badass system. And, um, you know, here's the world that we developed this in. So if you look at what happened, you know, what, what, what caused this explosion of innovation in, in big data? One of the, the, the main things that happened was uh, this development of all this interesting software, uh, particularly at Google and, and a couple other places, Amazon and so on. Uh, but that software it was all locked up, right? And these systems were able to crunch huge amounts of data, scale in ways that the commercial systems weren't able to scale. Um, but they were locked up in those companies. And eventually, people from those companies started going elsewhere and saying, boy, I really wish I had, you know, that MapReduce system I had, or that Bigtable system I had, or, 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 or that you know, DynamoDB system that I had uh, back when I was working at you know, company XYZ. So then they would build a version of that and put it out in the open source. And one of the most successful artifacts like that was something called Hadoop, uh, which has really two main components. One is a storage system called the Hadoop file system, which is an incredibly scalable file system. And the second is a processing engine called Hadoop MapReduce, which was modeled after the Google MapReduce system. And what that lets you do is run computations you know, across a cluster and have those computations scale across more machines as you're looking at more data. And what happened was that got out. A lot of people uh, started using Hadoop MapReduce. And they said, you know, it's pretty good, but it's not really good for what I want to do. Because what I want to do is, uh, is, is you know, graph processing, or what I want to do is, uh, is stream processing, or I want to look at, at, at sort of uh, nested data, or, uh, and, or, and so on. And so what people did is they said, okay, well, I'm going to take that basic idea of MapReduce, I'm going to specialize it to be a graph system, or to be a streaming system, or, 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 or you know, to be a, a nested data system. Okay? And that's kind of what happened. So you've had this explosion of innovation you know, from this initial very simple system into these very specialized systems. Our view is that's the wrong way to do it, right? So what we did in Badass was actually the opposite. We said, okay, instead of generalizing, I'm sorry, instead of specializing MapReduce, generalize it, all right? Make MapReduce do more things, okay? Because if you can do that, um, oh, sorry, if you can do that, let me get there, um, you, you know, people won't have to use a half a dozen different systems to solve their problem, and they won't have to copy these huge amounts of data from one system to the other, okay? So from a user's point of view, it makes sense. Okay, and what we realized is there's only two things, well, I shouldn't say only, but if there are two big things, if you could add them to MapReduce, you would be able to encapsulate all those different models I showed you on the previous slide. Um, the first is instead of just having map and reduce, you allow a somewhat richer uh, set of computations, and you allow those things to be structured uh, in a richer way, in particular using uh, directed acyclic graphs. Okay, so add a little, uh, add a little power to the model beyond just map and reduce. And then the second thing you need to do is allow those different jobs to share the data. So you don't have to copy things out of one system into another, out of that system into another, and so on. Okay? And if you can do those two things, you don't need you know, a dozen systems to process your data. So that's what we were trying to do. So we built a system called Spark, which I'm going to tell you about in a second, and then we've been layering on top of it all these different ways of looking at the data. You can look at the data as a database, running SQL queries, you can do streaming on it, you can do graphing on it, you can do uh, machine learning on it, okay? That's our approach. Now, for users, it's kind of obvious why that's a good thing to do. From, developer, from the developer's point of view, this is also pretty interesting. So this is lines of real code in these various systems. So you have Hadoop MapReduce, Storm, which is a streaming system, Impala, which is a query engine from uh, the company Cloudera, uh, Giraffe, which is an open source version of uh, the Pregel graph system, and, uh, and Spark, which is our, our engine. And um, those are different lines of code. And what you can see, Spark was uh, written in a very concise way. It was written in a language called Scala, which allows you to do that. So we got some benefit you know, just from the way we built it. But the real benefit is when you then start adding in all those different views of the data. So if you want to do streaming, it costs you know, that much code. And if you want to add in SQL processing, it costs that much code. 
And if you want to add graph processing, it costs that much code. So you can see that not only from the point of view of, of the user do you end up with a kind of a more comprehensive system, but also as a developer, you know, you're dealing with, with, with something that's going to be much more uh, efficient and, and sort of much more unified. So, you know, those are the arguments for why we did what we did. So what do we do? So here's what the stack looks like. Uh, and the color code um, is the following. So purple are things that are out there in the, op in the open source world that we work very closely with. Um, and then the blue things are things that we've built in the lab. The darker is stuff that's been out for a while. The lighter blue are things that we've released but are sort of in a pre-release or an alpha release. And um, at the lowest level is resource management where you worry about how do I manage all the, all the different machines in my cluster. We built something in the lab called Mesos, which we moved to Apache recently, which has become quite popular for doing that. Uh, the, the, the most vocal user of Mesos is Twitter, and uh, they run it, last we heard, on, on about 10,000 servers um, for a bunch of their processors. Um, at the storage level, we use Hadoop file system because it scales really nicely. We also talk to other popular types of storage systems. And then we built our own caching layer on top of it called Tachyon, which I'm not going to talk about today just because I don't have time to go through everything. Okay, but then, so this is kind of the platform. And, and the, the key thing here is you build things that, that play well with the popular, um, the popular packages out there, okay? Because, again, if you want to have real impact, if you, if, if you want to, um, you know, get people to try your stuff, you can't just you know, drive in a forklift with a whole new system and say, here, try my university built code. You know, build your company on that. Okay, so you have to play nicely with the things that are working in the real world. So that's a big part of what we do as well. So as you move up the stack, you start doing, looking at processing, and I'll, I'll talk about Spark and what that does, but this is where MapReduce sits in the Hadoop stack. And we have a streaming version, and we have some special support for machine learning. Uh, and then on top of that, we layer in, as I said before, those different ways of looking at the data, whether it's as relations or as graphs uh, or in the context of machine learning. Uh, and again, because uh, not everyone, believe it or not, likes to program in Scala, we were a little surprised when we found that out, um, you support other popular languages like, like Python and R, and there's also a Java interface to the system. All right. And then on top of that, we, we layer you know, the applications like I told you about. So what I want to do is uh, just tell you a little bit about Spark and then a little bit about what we've built here, and then I'll wrap it up. Okay, so let's talk about Spark. So, um, you know, Spark is the embodiment of this idea that we had of generalizing MapReduce. And, um, you know, the short reason for why Spark has really taken off is because it does everything you could do in MapReduce and it does it a lot faster. And it does more. So, um, and it compatible with the storage APIs, I said. And what I love about Spark is it came out of this idea that, that this, this lab uh, philosophy we have of combining people from different areas. And so Spark was really a collaboration between our machine learning people and our systems people in the lab. And the way it happened was like this. The machine learning people wanted to run an iterative algorithm, right? An algorithm that goes over the data multiple times. So logistic regression, I believe, was the one they were trying to do. So you're trying to draw a line that separates uh, these, two, these two classes of points. And so what you do is you draw a random line and then you move it or, you know, along a gradient and you do that for a number of iterations. And so each time you're moving that line, your line should be getting better, but you're going over all the data, right? So, you, you know, you're continuously going over the data. Now, when you do that in Hadoop, here's what happens. You read all your data in. Remember, we're talking about big data. That's why we're here. You read all your data from disk into memory. You do your iteration. You write the answer back out. Okay, well, now you've got to do another iteration. So what do you do? You read it in from disk, maybe even to different machines. You do your next iteration, you write it back out to the disk. Okay, and keep going. Okay, so it's a, about the slowest way you can think of communicating in a modern computer is through the disk. Right? You could print things out, you could OCR it and write it back in, that would be slower. But <laughs> if you didn't want to do that, you know, going through the disk is also pretty slow. The other thing, by the way, while I'm on this slide that Hadoop does, is if you're running queries, you run one query, it reads it into memory, and then you run your query. You run your next query, guess what? It reads it in from disk again. You run your next query, it reads it in from disk again. Okay? You don't pass database 101 if you build a system that works that way. It just, it's just too inefficient. So what was the big idea in Spark? <laughs> uh, big idea is don't do that through the disk. Do it through memory, right? Because memory is going to be a lot faster. So you read your data in, you iterate, you keep it in memory, you iterate. Okay? And for the queries, you read it in, and you have a buffer manager, and you let all the queries run from memory. 
makes perfect sense. Okay, and not surprisingly, when you do that, you get some good performance advantages. So blue is Hadoop, red is Spark. This is the first iteration. And you know, we're a little faster on the first iteration because we came later, we got to tune a few, we knew, we knew you know, where you needed to tune things a little bit. Okay, but we're about the same for one iteration. But what happens is as you keep doing those subsequent iterations, you know, Hadoop pays the same price for the tenth iteration that it paid for the first iteration. Whereas Spark, once you're in memory, you can run at memory speeds. Okay, and so that's how you start getting 10 times, 100 times speed up over you know, what you can do with MapReduce or Hadoop MapReduce. All right, so, so that's great. But you say, well, wait a minute. Okay, obviously putting things in memory is going gonna, is gonna to work. What's hard about that? And what's hard about that is that the whole reason, you know, the, the people who did Hadoop are very, very good systems people. And the reason they built, built it the way they built it is that they had a very particular use case in mind or environment in mind. The idea was they wanted to support basically, you know, infinite scale out. Okay, and so they wanted you to be able to add more and more machines as your problem got bigger and bigger. And they didn't want to be picky about what kind of machines that you were adding. So, you know, if you're walking down the street, you find a rack of servers that somebody put out on the sidewalk to get rid of, you know, you can bring those into your data center, plug them in, and you can use them. And so, in a world like that, where you're processing lots of data, right, your job's going to run for a while, the chance of a failure of any one of those servers failing during uh, the execution of your job is pretty high. Now, a traditional system, like a database system, if one of the nodes fails, it's not a problem. You just kill the whole job and you restart it, okay, because failures don't happen that often. But if you're designing for uh, an environment where failures happen all the time, that doesn't work. And so the reason that Hadoop uses a disk as much as it does is because they want to be able to recover from any one or you know, any small number of machines failing, right, and not have to start the job from the beginning. Okay, so that's what it was designed for. So if you want to say, okay, well, we're going to be smarter, we're not going to use the disk so much, we're going to use memory, then you have to figure out how to do that in a way that preserves that same fault tolerance guarantee. And that's really what Spark was able to do. And so we have an, uh, an abstraction we call resilient distributed data sets, which are basically, uh, they abstract away the sort of the collective memory of, of the cluster. Um, and the interesting thing about them is that they're immutable. Okay, so you're not allowed to change an RDD. All you can do is create one, and then you can create a new RDD by running one of a small number of, of coarse grain transformations. So uh, you can take an RDD and you can create a new one by running a transformation on it. And the kind of transformations we uh, support are things like map, reduce, Okay, so there you've got, you know, everything you can do with Hadoop map reduce already. And then you add in some more because they're important. You do joins, you do group buys, you know, you can do flattens, you can, you know, do sampling and other things. Okay, so that's what Spark did. It's Spark said, okay, we're going to have these immutable uh, objects that you can change only in these big jumps. Once you've done that, then it's very easy to keep track of, for any piece of data in your, competition, uh, in your computation, where did it come from? Right? And you use a concept called lineage, or in databases it's sometimes called logical logging. We, I'll show you an example, but you just say this piece of the data is an RDD that was created by transforming this previous RDD, which was created by transforming this previous RDD, and so on. Okay? And so it's very, very cheap to maintain during the execution. Okay? And if something fails, then you can recover that piece. And of course you have to be smart about checkpointing things in the background and all that, but those are all implementation details in a way. Okay, the important thing is the model. Now, what turned out to be the, the big aha with, with Spark was that these, this very limited interface, this very limited API, right, immutable objects that can only be transformed with this small library of functions was actually enough to capture what everyone was trying to do with all these different MapReduce systems, right? So it's, it's enough to do graphs, it's enough to do SQL, it's enough to do streaming, and so on. Um, and so that was kind of the beauty of how it worked out. It was kind of just the right level of interface for solving a lot of the problems people wanted to solve. Okay? And so here's an example of how Spark works. You can basically read in a, an HDFS file, and that becomes an RDD, and then you can um, process it. The important thing here is you're allowed to say cache. So cache this RDD in memory. Okay? Now, Spark is based on Scala, so it's evaluated lazily. So as you're running this computation, nothing's really happened yet. You can then take your cached messages and say, all right, now I want to count how many of those messages, say, contain a particular word. Okay, that's an action, now things start. So what happens is uh, there's a driver process. 
That contacts the systems that are storing uh, blocks of the file that you need. All right. Those systems process the data, right? They'll do the, their individual counts, just like would happen in a, in a MapReduce system. And then they send their counts back to the driver. The driver adds up the counts, and you get your answer back. Okay. But because we said cache right here, they also are smart enough to keep, uh, keep that cache data locally, right? So they keep the processed data in memory. So that the next time you use that data, so now we're going to run a different uh, count on that same data, now it happens in memory. Okay, so that's, that's, re that's really how it works. Okay? Now, if you take that program and you say, what does that look like for fault tolerance? Um, it basically turns into something like this. I created an RDD by reading this particular file. I created another RDD by filtering that previous RDD. And then I created another RDD by pulling out some text from each of the lines of the previous RDD. And that's all you need to know in order to be able to recover um, this guy. Okay? And of course, the system keeps track of where all the pieces are underneath. Okay? So the li lineage looks like this, and then there's some metadata that tells you where the pieces are. So if any node fails, that's the recipe for recreating what was on that node. Okay, so where's Spark? So that's what Spark is. Where is it? Um, it was recently uh, promoted to being, we, we basically gave it to the Apache Foundation because it was getting quite popular. Uh, it became a top level project last month uh, and um, it's got a, a growing uh, uh, contributor base. So uh, as I understand it, we're about to release 1.0. There's been about 150 people that have, that have code in that system. And if you think about this as university research, um, you know, where would you ever be able to get 150 coders uh, for a university project? So this idea of, of, of building something, getting it out into the open source world, building a community around it, is just a huge multiplier. And so Spark is kind of off on its own. Uh, there's a number of companies who have basically said they're going to support Spark, and it's basically uh, been chosen by a number of companies as sort of the, 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 pre, the you know, the, the, the in, it's going to inherit you know, the world, I guess, from uh, Hadoop MapReduce. Um, so there's a lot of uh, commercial interest around it. Um, there's a company that spun out that's currently certifying applications so that they can run on these different distributions of, of Spark. Uh, and it's being used by a bunch of different companies for, you know, doing everything from, uh, you, know, uh, you know, analytics on video streams, analytics on click data, uh, you know, various types of business intelligence, and then, you know, it's being used by a bunch of scientists, and I'm, uh, I suspect there's people in the audience here who are already using it as well. Um, and so, um, that's, what, that's what Spark is. Now, um, let me just talk briefly about a couple of things up here, uh, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. So, uh, you know, if you're a database person, it's fun to see that the whole NoSQL space is moving in an interesting direction, and that direction is called SQL. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that I don't have time to get into. Uh, but Shark is our implementation of that. So it's a system that lets you run SQL queries on a Spark, uh, on a Spark uh, data set, uh, in particular in RDDs. And uh, it's basically a combination of our system with the Hive system. Um, and you know, following our philosophy of, of working with what's already successful, um, you can take existing Hive queries and run them in Spark. Uh, I'm sorry, in Shark, and you can take existing data that you're already using Hive for and also use that uh, with Shark. So if you've got an existing Hive implementation, you can pull that out, you can pull in the badass stack, and you'll still be able to run your queries and they'll be hopefully a lot faster. Um, and we do a bunch of things to make it go faster, you know, the typical column-oriented stuff. We've tried to uh, introduce a lot more query optimization into the process, some smarter join algorithms. And the important thing here is that uh, there had been a bunch of people, even in the database community, saying that, you, you know, you could never build an efficient query processor on a MapReduce platform. And uh, that's just not true. So, so uh, Shark has shown that, that you, can, you can, in fact, if you take all the great things that we've learned about building database systems, move them into this new environment, you can build uh, very respectable systems. And I'll just show you one uh, benchmark result. This is a, a fairly complex query doing uh, joins and order buys. Uh, and this is running time. So this is Hive. That's the one everyone likes to run against because it's pretty slow. That's the Hadoop uh, SQL system. Tez is a new version of Hive um, that their developers claim is about twice as fast. And, and yeah, we found it's about twice as fast. Uh, that's fine. And then these other systems, this is Impala. 
Um, if Impala, the first time you run it, when everything's on disk, it takes that long. Once things are in memory, it takes that long. And you'll see that Shark, the first time you run it, then you cache it, has about very similar performance to Impala. Redshift is a, a full-blown relational database system that's hosted by Amazon. In this particular case, it's, it's a bit faster than, than the in-memory versions of, of our systems, but um, there's some, some of that is real and some of it is an artifact of the fact that, uh, that everyone else was running on vanilla Amazon instances, whereas Redshift is actually hosted by Amazon, and so they get to tune their instances for it. But you know, with a fairly small uh, input, you know, half a million records, uh, it looks like that. When you scale it up to uh, half a billion records, uh, you know, you see that things change a little bit and Shark actually ends up being a bit faster than Impala. The key thing here is that within this bigger framework, uh, we're able to have competitive performance, you know, with the best other uh, new database systems and also pretty decent performance relative to sort of a hand-tuned uh, uh, commercial system. Okay, so that's, that's the Shark system. And what's great is, in addition to getting performance that's you know, kind of within a factor of two of what you get using a specialized system, is you can then, if you want to do big data stuff, you can say, all right, well, here's our, log here's our logistic regression code, okay, and I'm going to define that as, as a function. And then I can use SQL, right, and create an RDD using the SQL statement, and then I can run my logistic regression on that result of the SQL. Uh, statement, and I can do that all within one, the same system, okay? So the, the big, our, our big pitch for the badass stack is performance of all the individual pieces are competitive with a specialized system, but it's all together, and you can sort of mix and match, you know, in this case, SQL and ML. I don't have time to go into it, but we have a system called GraphX, which also lets you do a similar thing where you can view your tables as if they were graphs. Okay, and then uh, do things like, you know, page rank and, you know, other types of things that you need to do graph processing on. Okay, and what that lets you do is something that's really hard to do with most existing graph systems, which is run a query on a graph, get some, identify some subgraph, and then run a graph algorithm on that. Again, in most systems today, you have one system for doing your, getting your subgraph, you have another system for running your graph algorithm on it. And here you don't have to do that. Okay, so GraphX lets you pull graph processing in as well. All right. Let me just say a couple minutes on uh, speed and accuracy, and then I'll wrap up. So uh, remember, so this was all about making things go faster, and that's what we spent the first few years of the lab doing. As, as we're moving you know, along the research track, we're moving more into this area of trade-offs. And um, in particular, the first trade-off we looked at was the time and quality trade-off. So you know, if you're you know, going through a big data set and you're computing some sort of metric, um, you know, the more data you look at, the better your answer gets. So this is the error going down as you look at more and more data. But the thing is, um, you know, if, you, if you've got a huge data set and it's going to take you tens of minutes to get through it, that's not an interactive system. So what you'd like to do is be able to look at things within a few seconds, okay? And so if you're doing exploratory data analysis, you might be fine uh, with, with, with some noisy answers as long as you get error bars, right? As long as you get some indication of how good those answers are. And so we built a system called BlinkDB that basically lets you do that. It says, hey, um, you know, I'm okay with an answer that's, that's not, you know, that's not complete, not over all the data. I'm willing to accept some noise. And so what BlinkDB does is says, okay, I can write my, my shark query, except I can say, you know, give me the best answer you can give me within two seconds. Or run this query until I have the certain level of confidence in the answer. Okay? And what BlinkDB does is it has samples of the data and it computes on the right granularity of samples to give you, you know, the answer within the, within the time or the quality constraints that you have, all right? And um, the, the magic of BlinkDB, and of course I don't have time to go into it, there's a paper in Eurosys last year that won the best paper award, uh, is, well, how do you compute those confidence intervals efficiently in a cluster, you know, on this kind of data, okay? And then how, why do you trust those confidence intervals? So BlinkDB is our first effort uh, in, this, in this area of trade-offs, okay? And uh, just quickly, uh, this is the time it takes to run a query on all the data. This is 10% of the data. Uh, and um, as you can imagine, running on 10% of the data in a big data system takes about a tenth of the time. And then, you know, this is running on 1% of the data and so on. And uh, for this particular query that we looked at, you know, with a, looking at only 10% of the data, uh, you can get an answer within a, a, a 0.02% error, right? 
But if that's still too slow, you can look at 1% of the data and then you would get a 0.07% error. Okay, that's what BlinkDB lets you do. All right, now there's a real problem with this, which is as uh, good database people, we know that our data is actually dirty. There's noise in the data. And so the argument that the BlinkDB guys made was, well, it's okay to take an answer that has noise in it because your data has noise in it, which is, you know, a reasonable argument, I think, to make. Um, but we looked at it differently because, remember, uh, the whole point of what we were doing was integrating algorithms, machines, and people. And so uh, what we're going to do is uh, basically figure out, you know, how do we bring people into the equation to help uh, with that problem of, of coming up with higher quality answers. And in particular, what we're, oh, I'm going to skip this because Tova's going to talk about that, uh, about how hard it is to compute with people, at least I hope so. Um, but, you know, basically the idea is you could take a sample the way BlinkDB does, okay, and then you can clean that sample, right? So if you have a small sample, it becomes small enough that you can actually give it to people or give it to algorithms to clean. And now you've done something really interesting. You can run your query on that clean sample, and then you'll get a better answer than BlinkDB would have given you. Okay? Or if you don't like sampling, you can take what you've learned from cleaning the sample and use that to correct the answer you get from running on the entire data set, in which case you can get a better answer than you'd get if you ran on the entire data set. Okay? So this is kind of the first glimmer I see of this vision we had at the very beginning of integrating you know, people into the analytics process in a, in a, in a real useful way. All right? And I don't have time to go into this in any detail, but um, I'll be around all day so we can talk about it. All right, we're working on a bunch of other stuff, machine learning, we're looking more at, you know, handling different kinds of updates, we're looking at, you know, changes in the hardware world in terms of different types of storage, different types of processors, different types of interconnects. You know, we've got uh, another two and a half years, we're going to be busy. All right, so let me just wrap up. Uh, you know, the view of the lab is uh, you've got three re resources to make sense of big data algorithms, machines, and people, and you've got to figure out how to get all those to work together in the right way. Um, we're building this badass stack to, uh, to, 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 to be our delivery vehicle for our ideas. So we're writing a lot of papers, we're graduating a lot of students, but we're putting out real working code that's being used um, really all over the world. Um, and the way we do that is by deeply engaging with the open source community. And that means having a commitment from the very beginning that the software we're building is stuff we're going to be willing to show to people. <laughs> it doesn't have to be perfect, but you can't be embarrassed to put it out in the world, so it's got to be of a certain level. Um, and, um, you know, the students, the students love it because they, their research doesn't, you know, sit in a paper that, if you're lucky, gets referenced by 50 other people. You know, they put stuff out and it gets, it gets you know, used by thousands of people or more. And so it's, it's, it's been a great complement to the research. Uh, and I told you a little bit about where we're going, you know, more advanced analytics, more advanced hardware, and, and really uh, trying to, trying to ex execute on this vision of, of integrating people uh, with the rest of the, of the process. And, and you'll hear more about that from, from other people t uh, later today. So that's it. Uh, hopefully I didn't go over too long, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>